Uh, hello and welcome to the Chiswick Book Festival with Peter Hennessy, the historian and crossbench peer whose latest work, Winds of Change on the UK in the early 1960s, is out now in paperback. And wherever you're watching us from, welcome. Hello, Peter. Good morning, Paddy. How are you? Well, I'm very well. It's lovely to see you. You're, you're not in beautiful Chiswick, I know. So where have you found in the world that could be more beautiful than Chiswick? I'm in a piece of heaven called the Orkney Islands. And through that window there, Paddy, is Scapa Flow, shining blue in the sun, sunset, sunrise, not sunrise, sunshine is the word I'm groping for. 81 years ago yesterday, because we're speaking on the 4th of September, we declared war on Germany. And the water out there began to fill with the great capital ships of the Royal Navy just as it had in the Great War. So it's full of ghosts, that water behind me. On this tranquil day, it was the geopolitical pivot of the world 81 years ago now. And it's all serenity today, every bit serene. You see history even in the flowing waters, wherever you go, you're always drawing these comparisons, which is why we're delighted to have you for 40 Zoom minutes. Um, Winds of Change is the last of a trilogy. And we're going to talk about the early 60s and also the rest of the trilogy. But in researching Winds of Change, in going back to the 60s, was that a happy time for you, the Peter Hennessy of the 60s? Was it great fun to go back to the early 60s? It was great fun in all sorts of ways, because I was at grammar school, and I'm one of those rare Englishmen that didn't have horror stories to tell about his schooling. I loved my grammar school in the West Country, and had a great group of friends. And we were all quite politically small p aware, and it was a great era for politics. It was the end of the Macmillan government. 1963, for example, was crammed, as Lady Bracknell would say, it was a year crowded with incident. The Profumo affair, Kennedy was shot. We were just coming through the Cuban Missile Crisis, the tremendous anxiety of the previous October of 62. And it was the year when the 60s began, really. So it was a great pleasure to go back. And in a funny way, it was like walking back into that era welcoming being welcomed back by the great figures of the era saying how nice to see you again we couldn't talk about this at the time well, would you like to see this classified document dealing with the cold war this one dealing with the bomb by the way would you like to look at my, look at my diary i've got I kept a really rather interesting diary Macmillan's diary was my companion through that volume you see every night in his spidery handwriting because he had a bullet through his hand at the battle of loose in the great war he would write up the events of the day and it was almost in SIGINT terms, signals intelligence terms, Bletchley terms, you might call it, as if I got him wired up for sound. And when he ceased to be prime minister in October 63, I felt bereft for a while. Suddenly, my insight, as it were, retrospectively, into what he was thinking and feeling every day had gone. But it was a delight to go back. And in many ways, one of the great pleasures of being writing the trilogy is it's been going back with my generation, looking at what made us and shaped us and walking through together and reliving it. That's one of the great pleasures of writing about the history of one's own times, but of course there are dangers in it. You remember too much, of, perhaps you were too much influenced by how you felt at the time rather than other people. And also you must always be aware of the stickiness of nostalgia coming up the works. Yeah, yeah. So both a pleasure and a danger, pleasure and a peril going back to write the history of one's own times. But I did enjoy it. The early 60s welcomed me back and I miss them already. Um, it's a fabulous way to start. You've teed up for us there one of the key characters we must talk about, Harold Macmillan, later Lord Stockton. And let's just talk about the title of the book, because to me, a sort of journalist, Winds of Change sums up a warning to the domestic British population that the empire's over, the Union flag is coming down, the colonial hats are coming off. Is that why you called it Winds of Change, British Empire? ending in the early 60s. That was certainly part of it, but also other winds were beginning to blow, weren't there? Winds of social change, right across the piece really, far more than we realised in the early 60s. But by the end of the 60s, we certainly knew about those winds of change. But it was Macmillan's famous speech to the South African Parliament in 1960, about a wind of change blowing through the continent of Africa, that gave the phrase, placed it in our political lexicon forever. So it was very much, fit. and also when you look back now, Paddy, we were very sensitive to questions of empire now and legacy and all that, quite rightly. But at the time, we were being engineered by the Macmillan government through the most enormous geopolitical shift, getting out of empire and, as Macmillan hoped, though he didn't pull it off, into Europe. 
And so many of the anxieties are the same, place in the world, our lack of productivity compared to the competitive nations, the lack of the skills base that we knew we needed to be to, to remain in an advanced industrial nation, equality, meritocracy, all the things that seem so familiar to us today were all there in the 60s in a different way, but definitely there's a continuity through. So, so the, the winds of change was Macmillan's phrase used in the South African Parliament. Yeah. Uh, he was speaking to two audiences. He was telling the colonies, we know we've got to leave. He was telling the British, look, it's over. But at the same time, he was wondering what's next. Could we ha hitch our wagon to Europe? And in the middle of all of this, you're telling me that the British population is feeling the tug of war. What is our place in the world? Where do we belong? Which hemisphere? Which geography? So that is exactly what we're moaning on about now every day. Exactly. It's very similar. What's this new global Britain going to be? And of course, Macmillan, like everybody else, was very stung in December 62 by Dean Asherson, who'd been Harry Truman's Secretary of State in the late 40s and early 50s, saying at a West Point graduation ceremony, the military, military school in New York, Britain has lost an empire but not yet found a role. And that really stung. And the role was going to be Europe. Macmillan was a broody intellectual character and he spent the gap between Christmas and New Year, 6061, in bed, feeling a bit poorly, drafting a 32-page memorandum, which he called the Grand Design. And the Grand Design was an attempt to pull all this together. And the key to it was getting into what was then the European Economic Community, a new terrain on which we could display our diplomatic skills in the world, a new basis on which to exert influence out of proportion to our size and our wealth. And at the same time, producing what was called the, the cold douche theory, the cold shock, of, uh, cold douche of water to invigorate British industry to new and better levels of productivity. So Macmillan was one of those strategic thinkers, quite rare in British politics really, mm. who was trying to integrate all the vectors of forces that were in operation to manipulate them in a way that would avert still further British relative decline compared to the super, super competitor nations and the booming six nations of the still very new European economic community. So the European question that has bedeviled us so much in the last three years, four years since the referendum was there, but it was in a different form. It was going to be the great hope mm. of a new British place in the world. Right. And Jeffrey Howe, Jeffrey Howe, a very thoughtful man, who was a young conservative politician at the time, used to like to quote Archimedes when I talked to him about it. Archimedes said, give, give me a place where I understand and I shall move the world. And Jeff, for my generation, that place was Europe. So it's very poignant to look back to that. Europe being the great hope of our new role in the world, whereas now shedding Europe is meant to be the great new hope of our place in the world. And were we better at disagreeing back then? Now we have seen a polarised, vulgar conversation there are death threats on Twitter cast around like confetti. It's a cesspit. Then there was no um, social media, but there was dreadful racism, dreadful sexism. I mean, was the early 60s a better place to have an argument about your place in the world? It was, there was much more civility around, a much more gentlemanly and gentlewomanly code of conduct amongst the politicians. Of course, they got fairly ferocious and had tremendous rows over nationalisation. But there was still a high level of consensus, which was the legacy of the Second World War, particularly on welfare provision. The Beveridge Report of 1942, comprehensive welfare system, was signed up to by all the parties. And Europe produced passion then as it does now, but the meanness of spirit, the coarseness of language that we've got so, well, we haven't got used to it. You and I have detested every minute of it, haven't we? Because we've often talked about this on your programme, BH. But that was not, that was absent. And yes, you're quite right, it was a less civilised society in the way it regarded gay people, people of colour and so on. It was, it was very intolerant. So we're going along with this civility, with these tremendous, this tremendous overhang of what we would now regard as quite reprehensible views. Let's look then at the big themes. If I summarise ones you've already mentioned, so we don't repeat them, our place in the world, the end of empire, the possible Europe, number one. Then what about productivity and the economy? and the welfare state. If I named those three, are those the big themes of your book in the early 60s? Yes, Macmillan would have lumped them all together under the term modernisation. You have this great modernisation programme. And remember NEDI, National Economic Development Council, was set up so that employers, unions and government could plan 
a higher level of sustained growth. Everybody signed up to the notion of 4% GDP growth a year. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if we'd ever achieved that? We never did. But that was the idea, which was much denounced in the 80s by Thatcherite conservatives as corporatism, which of course it was a very mild version of corporatism if it was corporatism at all. But the, the thrust of it was, we won't be able to pay for this place in the world and a generous welfare state unless our economy is more productive. We have to look at technical education, we have to look at skills, and we have to take the bitterness out of industrial relations. So it was a great attempt. Ralph Darendorf, that very clever and very nice German scholar, sociologist, who became a naturalised Brit in the end, who knew us very well, said that we were trying to pr produce a better yesterday. Mm. And in many ways that was right. It was, it was the post-war settlement, but funded better through a more productive economy. And, and the agility even then. But we couldn't, couldn't sustain it, our relative decline would just continue, you see. Because this is a trilogy, we're going to go back later in this discussion to talk about beverage in, in your book from Never Again on the 40s, and then about this attempt to improve conditions, having it so good. So we'll, we'll, put, we'll part that thought to return to it. But just then, just to ask you on, on that question, was there a big period of hospital building? Was there a big period of council house building in the early 60s? Um, did they have consensus that, oddly enough, the British people needed somewhere to live? A, a consensus which seems to have, have gone away. Macmillan himself led the huge housing drive as Minister of Housing when the Churchill government came back in 51, pledged 300,000 a year new houses and how he could do with that now, and achieved it. And it was Enoch Powell, that extraordinary, that very strange, very eloquent man, as Minister of Health in the early 60s, who laid out the first big hospital building programme after the war, because the health service, as we all know, had been created in 48, but there had not been enough money to have a really solid, big hospital building programme, as opposed to patching up the old hospitals, until Powell became Minister of Health. He was one of the great ministers of health, and because of the notoriety that he attracted later, because of his views on immigration so starkly expressed, that hugely constructive period of Powell's political life is largely forgotten but he deserves great credit for it. So who are the other big people of the book, Winds of Change? Harold Macmillan, Prime Minister, Enoch Powell, Minister of Health. Who have we got stacked up on the other sides, plural? Well, when you look back to the 1959 general election, it was a, the two leaders were Hugh Gateskill uh, for Labour and Harold Macmillan for the Conservatives. And the very mercurial, very fascinating and very appealing Joe Grimman for the Liberals I don't want to get into golden ageism about the political class. It's a tremendous difficult. Well, now I'm over 70, I'm almost licensed to be a buffer, aren't I? Not quite. So I have to, have to put Bufferdom on one side for, this, for the purposes of this conversation. But wouldn't we do, we both, wouldn't that be quite a line up now? An electoral competition between Grimmond, Gateskill, and Macmillan. And Hugh you... Gateskill is the lost hope, really. He died of what was then regarded as a rare disease in early 63 to be replaced by Harold Wilson. Of course, Harold is a very, becomes a very dominant figure in the story before the book ends in 1964, and he wins the, the, this 1964 general election. So as a cast of characters, it was very rich. And also the tier just below was very rich. Rad Butler, Macmillan's number two, one of the most enigmatic and fascinating conservatives of the era, who'd produced the 1944 Education Act in the coalition government, Churchill's wartime coalition, which was the basis for schooling until the comprehensive system came in in the mid and the 60s and after. He was absolutely fascinated. And of course, Labour too had great figures like Dennis Healy, a very substantial figure too, and Jim Callaghan. So they're all, but they're all men basically, aren't they? They're, they're, we haven't apart, from, yet... apart from the great Barbara Castle, yeah. who is never to be underestimated, a force of nature. It was Barbara who, it was a wonderful interviewee when I was doing with Rob Shepherd a television series for Channel 4 in the 90s called What Has Become of Us, about the early post-war years, which was covering the period that the trilogy covers pretty well. And we went to see Barbara, and she was an Irene Bevin's parliamentary private secretary after the war, the great Minister of Health, who, who got the NHS through Parliament and so on, set it up. And she said to me, Nye said to me, you know, in 1948, Barbara, he said, if you want to know what this is all for, look in the perambulators. You see, well, I was in there. That was me. <laughs> I was in Nye's perambulator. This book is written by a member of Nye's perambulator generation for other members of Nye's perambulator generation, but also for our children and grandchildren one day, I hope to say, so that they get some idea 
this is a bit immodest of me saying this, but they help, might help them get a little bit of an idea of what shaped Nana and Grandad's generation, you see. That's another reason for writing the history of one's own time. It's a bit of a compulsion. It's a great privilege to be able to do it, but again, one has, has, to, has to be careful about the nostalgia, the, the, the golden age theory. But it wasn't, it might not have been a golden era. It was full of anxiety and the Cold War was a huge and constant overhanging anxiety, but it was certainly a gilt-edged era. And we were much more optimistic than we now are. We've shown immense social solidarity since the pathogen struck in March. And in many ways, we've rediscovered ourselves as a people. The Thursday evening clap and cheer for the, for the care workers and the NHS, mm. that, that's us rediscovering ourselves. But we have, we're not as optimistic as we were then, and not just because we're living in common Britain. There's but a pessimism there wasn't in the early 60s. I mean, we think we're pessimistic now with plenty to be pessimistic about. But then you have the assassination of a US president, the Cuban Missile Crisis that nearly led to a nuclear annihilation. You have the end of empire, you've just come off the back of the Suez Crisis, you had horrible racism, and yet you had optimism. So let's ask you why you're ending with the 1964 general election, and, and why, where did you yourself follow the results? Well, I'm finishing partly because I'm running out of energy to do these huge archival trawl books, to be candid, really. It's a pity, but I'd like to have gone on, but I haven't got the energy to. I'll keep writing, but not the, on those great chunky, chunky volumes. But also, it's the, the, first, it's the first phase of the post-war period, ending in 64. The 64 general election was essentially a competition about who could modernise most effectively and fund that post-war settlement to the level that it was needed, while preparing us for a future world in which computing, the, 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 the Reith Lectures of 1964, the BBC Reith Lectures were given by a man called Leon Bagrit, The Age of Automation. And I, I used to read them in The Listener Paddy, that great magazine that the BBC used to produce. I was quite an avid follower of those Reith, those Reith Lectures. So it was a strange hinge election. I suppose they all are, but this one was in particular. The competition was who could modernise most effectively to fructify the post-war settlement and improve it still further so, and our place in the world. So we were being offered an, an old aristocrat who'd been shot in the hand in the First World War and a young meritocrat who had worked on statistics in his lifetime, I believe. Remember, remember Alec Hume had replaced Harold Macmillan by the time of the election? Yes, I beg your pardon. Another aristocrat, but he hadn't been shot in the hand in the war. So we were lovely, being, man, Alec, lovely man, Alec Hume. I, um, but, I, but the aristocracy versus the meritocracy, was that kind of how it felt? Right. It was a tweedy aristocrat up against a gritty meritocrat. And it was almost out of central casting. I, I remember going to see Alec Hume with some documents that had been declassified, I think to do with Suez actually, to his place in the, in the borders. And we were waiting for the taxi to take us back to the Berwick station. And he said, look at that tree, that magnolia. It only flowers once every 25 years, you know. He didn't open his mouth much, you remember Alec, it's very clear. I said, it's a lovely tree. You never really wanted to leave here, did you? No. You never really wanted to be Prime Minister, did you, Alec? No. Terrible intrusion in one's private life, he said. Well, those days are gone, aren't they? But, but he was a lovely and he nearly won the election. I was going to say, having forgotten, having briefly forgotten it was him, I've, I've got on my notes to ask you that, in fact, this aristocrat, shoehorned in to lead the Conservative Party, nearly won the 64 general election. He did indeed. He, uh, Wilson's majority was six, and only in the early afternoon of the Friday of after the election, October the 16th, I think it was, 64, when Brecken and Radler, I think, was the key result, came in. Only in then did we know that Wilson would have a majority and would become Prime Minister. It was a very close run thing, and I was in my sixth form room in, in my grammar school, Marling School in Stroud, with a little tranny. Remember trannies? Listening to the tranny to get the results, and indeed, Harold Wilson on the train, the great statistician, as you mentioned earlier, coming down from the, on the 8.15 from Liverpool, Lime Street, his constituency being Hyde and Liverpool, you see, in the morning. I think not, he, but around about Nun Eaton, using his slide rule, and the tranny turned on to pick up the signal when they stopped at the station. He thought he wasn't going to make it, and he would disappear for the weekend to play golf, having failed narrowly to become Prime Minister. So it was a very close run thing, very dramatic, very exciting. And there, the book ends. That's the winds of change. You've sketched some of the themes and demonstrated the clear passion, but I promised to put it in its place in the trilogy. So I want to go back to the 1950s. The book, your book there, was called Having It So Good. And were there any primary colours shared between these, the 60s and the 50s, from hot war to cold war by way of Suez, 
questions of our place in the world, and of course, funding the welfare state. Did the 50s share some of the big themes you've just sketched out for us from Winds of Change? Certainly, and you're right to put it the way you have, because the 50s has been rather overshadowed by the 60s, particularly the 60s after I finished writing the trilogy from 64 onwards, the high 60s, as I would call it now, if anybody yeah. remembers. And the 50s seemed terribly drab, drab and conformist compared to the, that, but they weren't, because the Suez Crisis, the Anglo-French invasion of Egypt, which ended in such disaster, produced a whole burst of questioning and a kind of youth quake, but not, the, not in the terms of the Mary Quant youth quake that came later, but a political youth quake, questioning one's elders. Out of that Suez experience and the 50s experience came the satire boom, for example, in the early 60s. That was the week that was and beyond the fringe. And that was an extraordinary episode. But also, the 50s was ceasing to be drab. Rationing ended in 1954, finally. And we had the first bloom of a mass consumption society, which I remember exquisitely, really, because not until the late 50s, early 60s, did I taste steak. Steak, for me, was something in a tin with carrots in it. And I hadn't eaten a proper bit of steak until my Auntie Molly, who ran a pub in South Wales, took us one Sunday, because the pubs were closed in Wales on Sunday, to a friend of hers who ran a Bernie Inn, and he cooked proper steaks for us. And I can remember it now. I can, there's, two, there's two taste bud moments for me in the 50s. One is a little Cub Scout on Hampstead Heath on a beautiful, chilly, early spring evening in May 1954, having my first bottle of Coke. Oh. The cold Coca-Cola from one of those machines on my taste buds, Paddy, I can feel it now. And filling up with the memory. The other is that steak at the end of the 50s. So we, we rationing, rationing, it's extraordinary to think that rationing lasted until so long after the war, nine years after the war, but it did. Mm. There were sunbursts in the 50s, though. The coronation year was a magnificent moment, not just because of the beautiful young queen and so on, but also because a, a Commonwealth expedition had climbed Everest just in time for the news to break in London on the morning of the coronation. And it was a you felt you were part of, as a little boy reading the Eagle comic, which I did avidly, you felt you were part of a success story country, which had shown great social solidarity in the war, had come through against very high odds with its allies and prevailed in the Second World War, and shown immense social solidarity at home in doing so. And yet we were technologically in the lead on jet aircraft, both civil and military. We were about to produce the first nuclear power station to put power into a civil grid and called a hole. And the Eagle comic was full of those sort of cutouts of a new modernised Britain. The Gatwick Airport cutout, I remember, it was going to solve Britain's air traffic problems for ever, ever, ever to come. Oh, come bloody contraire, as it turned out. The beginnings of a motorway programme. Can you imagine I was a sort of nerd who got excited when we drove across the, the M1 in Northamptonshire on the way from Gloucestershire to see my sister Kathleen in Northamptonshire. I'd asked Dad to stop the car on the bridge over, over the M1 so I could look at it. This motor, I mean, can you imagine being thrilled by a motorway? <laughs> no, uh, I, not. A few, yes. I, I think it all fits. It all fits, doesn't it? But then so, I'm, I'm cantering through because those are some of the themes of the 50s. Some of the themes of the 40s we've touched on. The book there that started your trilogy was Never Again. Of course, that perfectly in two words sums up this feeling. The Conservative government led, led by Winston Churchill has to go. And it has to be replaced, say, the public by people who will actually build houses, who will put the beverage port report commissioned by the coalition, led by Winston Churchill, important to mention, but will carry out the beverage report. So what is the big theme of Never Again with which this trilogy begins? Well, the beverage report was fascinating because it was the basis of the 45 electoral competition, as you say, and both parties were committed to it. It was a question of how soon and how much and at, pay, at what pace and on what scale, really. And Labour was more trusted to do it, I think, than the pre-war Conservative governments. The public loved Churchill as the coalition leader, but they didn't like the party he was leader of. I don't think he liked his party much either, to be honest. Well, he switched several times, didn't he? He switched. He had, uh, well, the lovely Paul Addison, who we lost this year, a wonderful historian, said Churchill was a politician with no fixed address. He <laughs> well, put it rather well, I think. But never again, never again, the title comes from never again slump in the 30s, never again war, collective security. We must not go back to that Britain of class division and high levels of poverty. And it was an attempt to, as it were, in one go, the beverage report was very well constructed, to tackle all the ills that being the first industrial nation in the world had brought, 
the slums, the squalor, the inequality, and so on. And the genius of the beverage report, Paddy, we've never had one since, was it identified the five things you had to do simultaneously if the crust of deprivation was to be pierced. And he put it in this wonderful language that are five giants on the road to reconstruction. Ignorance, idleness, squalor, disease, want. And the idea that was if, if you hammered them all at the same time, you would produce this better world. But it all depended on full employment. Idleness had to be tackled forever. Because without full employment, you wouldn't be able to finance it. But never since have we had such a comprehensive look at all the ingredients of well-being for a nation. And I've often wondered why we've never had another beverage since. We've done it in little, little pieces. When you think about the use of language too, it's fascinating. If a Secretary of State for Work and Pensions produced a draft of the Cabinet of a white paper, which talked about giants on the road to reconstruction and put them in capital letters, he or she would be offered counselling at least, wouldn't they? Well, especially if you accuse the public of ignorance. I mean, because in the way that modern politics goes, the public can't really ever be at fault. Can't, I mean, that's, that's a very difficult area. That is a political divide. When is it my fault? Ignorance, ignorance meant inadequate education provision, not, not ignorance in that well, sense. Well, that's, yeah, that's right. But also it did came into it, it was sometimes characterised as sloth, sloth, wasn't it? Yes, it could be, yes. But it was, it was getting secondary schooling for all, which was Rab Butler's great achievement with the 44 Education Act, actually, of which I'm a beneficiary. My generation, not all of us by any means, of course, but quite a lot of us were the grammar school generation. We were Rab's children. And we ran from 1944 to the mid 60s when the comprehensive schemes came in. So Rab's children is a particularly interesting generation of men and women, I think, in British life. And so I, as one of Rab's boys, as it were, that's one of the reason I wanted to write the trilogy. I always intended the trilogy to go on to be a trilogy that reached the turn of the century, but I got too absorbed, you see. Yes. It's really fascinating to go back. There's always another set of documents you want to look at. There was somebody some, some retired figure from Whitehall or the cabinet room you want to go and interview. It's very hard to know when to stop, you see. Yeah. It all got too absorbing in a way. But the thing is, that's what happened to Star Wars. They kept remaking new episodes and then they had to do a prequel because it got, it got too absorbing. And you are very much like the sort of Yoda uh, of the post-war British settlement. But I've got to try and keep us focused. And I'm wondering if you could tell me, because I know that you're interested in this phrase, pessimism breakers, that sort of big political moments in Britain are sometimes accompanied by moments or people who can break the pessimism. Was Attlee put in to say it's peace? We love you, Winston, but in putting Attlee there, we are making a gesture towards peace. We are saying peace in our time. We are saying different leader. Was, is there anything about making Clement Attlee, humble man, represent something for the voter? Clem Attlee is absolutely fascinating because as my friend Douglas Jay said to me, who worked for him in, the, in, in number 10 after the war, he never used one syllable where none would do. I mean, he didn't exactly make the language glow and weak, but he was inspirational by being uninspirational. It was extraordinary. But he fitted the times of, of social reconstruction. That was really what the basis of Clem was. And he, having become, he was a public school boy, but he was in the Haleybury settlement, the Haleybury school settlement in the East End, which is where he formed his socialist views. And he had a great sense of those key elements of well-being that everybody had to have for a good life from what he did in the East End, living in the dock communities and working there. And his government was very, what he was, what he was brilliant at was keeping his government concentrated on the essentials because the cabinet was full of big egos, far more dazzling figures than he would ever be. But in this understated Major Attlee way, he kept them disciplined and he kept them tight and he fulfilled his manifesto. Uh, let us face the future, almost to the letter. And essentially, it was implementing beverage. But of course, he and Ernie Bevin, his great foreign secretary and his great rock of his cabinet, his great supporter, had to deal with the freezing of the Cold War and the atomic bomb question, should we become a nuclear nation or not? It was an extraordinary six years of that government, but it reset the course of British politics and in a way that was not changed until Mrs Thatcher's extraordinary long premierships that followed. And, and, and the answer... And it, yeah. And it, come through, you see. The NHS is classically a product of that era. And the Conservative government would have introduced an NHS too after the war, to be fair. But I just wanted to nail down because it, it's often said that it's a labour bomb, isn't it? it, was, it the, the nuclear bomb yes. was a labour bomb. Absolutely. 
it, there was a cabinet committee meeting in 46 about whether we could afford the gaseous diffusion plant, I think it was, to make the raw material of the bomb. And only Bevin came back in late from a liquid lunch, I would imagine. And the discussion was going against doing this because we couldn't afford it. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, staff of Crypt, of Dalt, Hugh Dalton, and the President of the Board of Trade, staff of Crypt, were persuading their colleagues that we couldn't afford it. It would detract from post-war rebuilding and the engineering drive and so on. And Ernie Bevin sat down and said, I'm not having this. I'm not having anybody spoken to in the way the American Secretary of State has spoken to me. I don't care what it costs. We've got to have the fissile, we've got to have the bomb, we've got to have the bloody Union Jack on top of it. And he seized the discussion and turned it round. So it's a Labour bomb, all right. It wasn't tested until Churchill was back in number 10, but it's Clem and Ernie's bomb. And on that, this is a question I've deliberately placed here. There has been some uh, rehearsal, even though I've made two mistakes with you so far, Peter, and counting. Um, the public changed forces again, they put Churchill back in. Now, is that because they sort of felt that the, the job that they'd wanted, the technocratic bit they wanted had been done, and now they did want a bit more charisma? And Simon Sharma said of you that you would have gladly cleaned Clement Attlee's pipes. So who would you have voted for, uh, Clement Attlee or Winston Churchill? Mine was a conservative household, which of course revered Churchill, as many people did across the political spectrum. But Clement Attlee is my one political hero. Simon is a great friend of mine, he's quite right. If Clement wanted a pipe cleaned by me, he'd have had a pipe cleaned by me. <laughs> because the, the, the country was worn out in 1950-51. Rationing was still there, still pretty tight in some areas. I think they wanted a bit of respite. And Churchill promised them red meat and not getting scuppered. He didn't have elaborate promises that he made, but he, the, the easement on the rationing front, not getting scuffered, meant not going to war with Russia. And so it was, it was a, he, he was very much past his best, but he was a still magnificent figure. It's hard now to look back, but to many people at the time, he's, he was portrayed, and certainly since, as a kind of walking off license come pharmacy in, those, in that last premiership, you know, reliant on pills and so on. And, the brandy bottle but on his day he was truly formidable and Churchill's great gift in that last premiership which he didn't pull off but it was a, it was a noble huge noble effort was to try and ease the east-west tensions before the hydrogen bomb which is a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb came to the fore and destroyed us all and that was why one of the many reasons he clung on to the premiership too long probably right until 1955 but he was magnificent uh, figure and what a choice though Brisk, terse little Major Attlee and Winston Churchill. I mean, what a choice. What a choice. Yeah. Well, I mean, there we are scampering through this huge area of your life. You've given your life to writing these books and we're scampering through. But we want, no, briefing, the, the briefing you've given us, just four or five questions on the present compared to that. Alongside what you have mentioned, the beverage report, the in British bomb, the welfare state, the Suez crisis, the end of empire. Where is Brexit? Where is COVID? And where is now? Well, we are really are at an extraordinary point in the, in the COVID year, in the pathogen year of the pathogen. I do hope, and maybe I'm being naive. Many people think I, I friends and friends and think I am probably being naive. So I do hope that out of this shared experience, that they, you can't compare it to World War II, which was total war, six years, rationed up to the eyes, huge death count. I'm in no way demean, diminishing the death count that we've got from COVID, which is over 41,000 as we know. But I am hoping that out of this intense shared experience, the most intense shared experience since that great collective experience of World War II, can come some good. And I was, I'm thinking, I'm writing a book called A Duty of Care, written before and after Corona. And one of the chapters is called A New Beverage and a New Politics. And what would a new beverage be? We'd all have our own version of it. But I would think the five things I would concentrate on if I was a politi poli political politician, which I'm not, I'm a crossbench peer, I'm independent, but I'm not a politician. Independent member of the House of Lords It's not quite being a politician. And my five would be social care, immense urgency. We've got to do that and fast. I mean, it's the, we owe that to the COVID fallen and their families and the care workers who looked after them. We, we've needed it for ages, a national care service set alongside a national health service. My second one would be social housing. We've fallen way behind most Western European nations in the number of houses we build for people. 
and we need a public-private mix, but a big push on public housing, comparable to Harold Macmillan's one in the early 50s. We need to get technical education right for the first time. We've been trying to do this since the 1860s, and we still haven't got it right. And what we're, the, the fifth one, the fourth one rather, would be artificial intelligence. If we don't get our technical skills up to make use of that and to prepare society for artificial intelligence, we won't have the wealth or the wherewithal to do the decent things for society. And the fifth one would be climate change. I'd add a sixth actually for a little bit after, but I'm this because we need to look at our constitution and our, in, our institutions. We need to refresh them, but we can't really do that until we know what's gonna happen in Scotland. We won't know that until the mid 2020s. But that for me is an agenda for the current political generation to seize upon, to avoid the 2020s, the politics of the 2020s and the national conversation of the 2020s being full of bitterness and recrimination and sideshows of the worst kind, which is what Brexit, the Brexit experience has given us. We've got to rise to a new level of events. And I think COVID could be the shock to produce a better political class and a better political outcome. And I think that consensus that I've outlined is not a soft, fudgy one. It's a hard edge one. And it's lying there for the taking. And it needs to be picked up by somebody or groups of people in politics and in public life and in the public generally who can find the language in which to express it, to mobilize the language in the service of improvement. And the pessimism. That's, that's the really pessimism, what I'm writing this book about. The pessimism breaker in this era could be a British inspired, British led vaccine. It's an international effort and it is a big row about the nationalism of, of, of the vaccine. But if the British had a demonstrably uh, pr aggressive muscular role in creating a vaccine, that would also create a lot of optimism and a lot would be possible at that moment politically. I think that's a very interesting thought, Paddy. Of course, science is international. Of course, it doesn't matter in the big scheme of things where the virus or, vi or the, the vaccines, the vaccines plural, come from as long as they work. But it would be a great thing if it was a British lab that paved the way to the successful one, the first one, the big, the big path breaker into that new vaccine world. And I don't think it's nationalism to want that because we're rightly proud of our labs and our, and our scientists and our technologists. The, the balance of payments figures that we, the only ones that we can be happy about are these ones. We give the world about 1.5% of its population. We give the world about 10% of its scientific papers, but we give the world 15% of the most cited scientific papers. We think much heavier than our weight. And it would fit with that rather good and justified and rather genuine pride in it of that self-image we have about sort of thinking above our weight if the vaccine could come out of a British lab. And this is not me flag waving. I, I understand what you mean. It would help. The phrase pessimism breakers, which is interesting, it's an American economic historian used it about the, the early post-war years in both the United States and here, because there were widespread fears in both America and here after the war that there would be economic dislocation and the slump as there had been after the Great War. But when it was realized that we weren't going to go back to that, that economic methods had been found to prevent that, and you could have sustained an incremental economic growth, that was a huge pessimism breaker. Oh, and my heavens, we need a pessimism breaker or two now. You're absolutely well, right. Well, I mean, you perhaps are one of them. I mean- well, that's very kind, you should think so. This could be, there's, anything on that scale would be like inventing a steam train, really, for which, finally, I imagine you've never forgiven the establishment for, for, for cancelling the steam train. <laughs> you know me quite well, don't you? I was warning earlier about the danger of nostalgia, but I still almost weep when I hear Flanders and Swans, the slow train, that beautiful song they wrote and sang about... They, they, they sang the litany of the stations that Dr. Beeching's famous report of 63, the closing down of those beautiful rural stations, so ending up with the slow train on the slow train. Do you remember? I'm filling up again at the memory. I, I, I don't love those locomotives. I love those locomotives. They were the nearest thing that science and technology and industries ever produced to living beings. Every loco had its own personality, as, you can, as the drivers would tell you. And I was there with my little duffel coat on and my little numbers at the end of the book. I was one of those, there's a book I written a few years ago, I forget his name now, it's very good, called Platform Souls. And I was one of those souls at the end of the platform. And that's the era when the steam trains went. And I've got two abiding memories of the steam trains from the era in which I'm writing, where 
nostalgia has completely overcome me now. Any pretense of being a detached historian is out of the window from, from, from now on. One is going up on a banker engine at T Bay, where the expresses from Euston to Glasgow went hit the edge of the Lake District, and they would they would whistle down the Loon Valley if they needed a banker engine. They'd roll through T Bay Station, and out of the shed would come a banker engine. I would with my dad in '61. It was too wet to climb in the Lake District, so we got to T Bay. And we caught it up, up with it, and we pushed it over T Bay, over the top of Shat Fell, in howling wind and rain, drinking tea the colour of oxtail soup from one of those aluminium cans that the, that the fireman made, and then rolling back down to T Bay. I, that's deeply impressive. One of the last memories I shall cherish when I, and all the other memories have gone really pretty well of the 60s, that'll be the one. And the saddest one of all is my grammar school was up against the railway line, just between Stroud and Gloucester, just outside Stroud. And on, on the late afternoons when we were leaving in 63, 64, quite often you'd see a row of dead steam locomotives pulled by one that was still operable, being taken from the sheds somewhere in London probably, or other sheds like maybe Swindon, to the breakers yard in Barry Island. And I think there was one at Sharpness Docks by the Seven. And there were these dead locomotives going to their graves. And I, I can look back now with complete nostalgia on that. I can tell. I can't even say that really. I, well, it's, it's there, we, we end where we began, which is with your passion for the early 1960s. And of course, we've tried to ask you, or I've tried to ask you to, to bring us all of your great learning into just a few minutes with some footfalls from me along the way. You've been very patient. And to you watching, thank you for putting up uh, with the technology here that we've been doing. Uh, Peter's book, Winds of Change, is out now in paperback, as I believe are the others in the trilogy. And from Peter and me at the Chiswick Book Festival, we say goodbye in the style of the two Ronnies. Peter, will you go first? Goodbye. If you have to say it's goodbye from me. Oh, goodbye from me. And it's That's... goodbye from him. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs> well done, Peter. <laughs>